welcome to the SNI podcast. With deep roots in the Canadian regulatory landscape for the last 18 years, SNI has helped hundreds of companies get on the shelf quickly and compliantly so that they can sell more and grow their brands. On this show, you'll hear stories from SNI's clients plus the team's insights on how to overcome your biggest compliance issues and create a standout brand in the food and natural wellness space. The SNI podcast is your source for market compliance. Now, on to the episode. Welcome everyone to this episode of the SNI podcast. Today we're going to be discussing one of our member associations, Food and Beverage Manitoba. Food and Beverage Manitoba is an industry-led, not-for-profit association that launched in 1993 in order to support Manitoba's food and beverage manufacturers, um, industry members, to achieve their full creative and competitive potential. They work diligently to ensure that their members are supported, they get the resources that they need in order to be successful in Manitoba's market. We're so pleased today to be joined by Mike Mikuluk, the Executive Director at Food and Beverage Manitoba, as well as SNI's own Director of Business Development, Stuart Greenfield. Thank you both for being here. Thank you. Mike, why don't you start by telling us a bit more about Food and Beverage Manitoba? What does the organization do? Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you for having me here. Uh, so as you said, Food and Beverage Manitoba really here is to support the very diverse uh, food and beverage ecosystem within the province. So this is an incredibly hard sector to make a go in it. And there's a lot of different companies at various sizes, various stages. And we're really here to provide them with the resources they need. Um, we tend to think of it in terms of people, profit, and planet. So when it comes to people, we're here to sort of provide them with uh, the training they need. So whether it's food safety, whether it's training around uh, some kind of regulatory compliance, whether it's looking at trends that are coming down the pipeline, we're there to sort of provide accessible training um, for them. Uh, that also sometimes extends to sort of customized services. So um, for uh, quite a few years now, all of our members have had access to HR on demand. So this is a program where you can call in and you can get resources from an HR professional um, onto there. Um, we do a lot of partnerships with other organizations. So for example, we partner with the Winnipeg Chamber of Commerce on their code initiatives. So all of our members have access to their training related to equity, diversity and inclusion. And then we'll try to take a look at things that are maybe a little bit further down uh, the pipeline. So um, especially around sustainability, ESG, those kinds of uh, those kinds of pieces. We're trying to sort of prepare people. So it might be just very introductory um, uh, courses around it and, and training, or it could be very in-depth. Uh, and that could involve sort of one-on-one, -on -one, so workforce development. We work a lot with uh, post-secondary uh, institutions, make sure that that pipeline of students and talent and skills is there. We work with a lot of other nonprofits that are sort of trying to get um, people interested in the sector. Um, I think this is a, a lot of people don't realize the size of this sector. Um, you know, I was actually quite surprised that this is the largest manufacturing sector uh, in the province. Definitely, yeah. I, de I do think that that comes to bit of a shock to people they mm -hmm. don't realize how big it is and yep. how much support is needed and it's so great that you are working to support all the members within our industry mm -hmm. and how would you say industries evolved over the past three decades when this has been an association and and how does fab mb keep up with this the changing demands yeah i mean i think industry has changed quite a bit i think the way that people eat has been changing for years. I know you guys are uh, work with a lot of clients that are involved in things like nutraceuticals and functional foods. Yep. I think this has been a huge trend uh, over the last few years. Uh, things like local food, um, you know, people are really interested where their food is coming from. Um, obviously, taste and, and, and sort of cost is always top of mind, especially right now with inflation, the way that it's going. Mm -hmm. But I think for a lot of people, they expect a lot more out of their food, right? They want to know that it was produced sustainably. They want to know that it's having some sort of benefit. So a lot of people are interested in things like high protein. They're interested in, um, in benefits to their brain, to their sleep, to other sort of functional ingredients. So I think the expectations of our food system are significantly higher. And as a result, people are really looking for things like clean labels. They're looking for, um, you know, they're, re they're looking for those unique things. I see that you guys have the cricket powder in the background. <laughs> So interesting kind of products like that, interesting uh, uh, components. The, obviously, plant-based has really exploded as well. So I think the days of just sort of going in and treating 
food as fuel and the sort of um, are just gone and and those expectations are that much higher i think what i also find interesting and i partly coming from fab but also the province and other places is a number of small ethnic companies that have yep. started up in the yep. last year who are looking for guidance on yep. things to start like nutrition facts tables yes um, that we're working with so i think it's really interesting that the food palette is mm -hmm. really evolving in manitoba as a result of the influx of uh, immigration yes. and the acknowledgement that people now want to try a broader range of foods. They're gone beyond that traditional palette of foods. Yeah, absolutely. And I think um, you definitely see like kind of unique flavor offerings from even traditional, um, you know, companies, whether it's like a chip or a cracker or something like that. You see sort of really interesting sort of combinations of flavors. I think people are a lot more uh, adventurous they travel with their palates right and they mm -hmm. want to sort of experience these uh, these kinds of flavors from around the world um, which I think is a huge opportunity for a lot of people they can come in with uh, with something unique but it also is really challenging because it you know the amount of new products in the grocery store every year is astounding uh, and it's not cheap getting a, a product onto the grocery shelves and I think that's part of the, what we try to do at fab is to sort of support people in understanding okay well what does it mean to bring a product to the market. How do you think about that product market fit? How do you hedge some of the risk um, when you're bringing it into there? Because it is difficult. I'm every day. I'm surprised how hard it is to to to, to survive in this industry. And one of the things that people who are new to the industry are really challenged by and don't quite understand is the regulatory requirements. Yes. And they say, "Well, I wrote down that I've got yes. water and whatever. Since that's not quite what it is." So working with and helping walk them through sort of we become a partner with them, um, making sure that they get what they need so they can be on the shelf and not have to worry about having product pulled and creating, you know, that recall environment that can destroy, especially a young startup brand. Because yes. nobody looks at the reason for the recall. They just see recall and assume it was something dangerous, not a simple labeling error. So uh, it's very rewarding, and I know our team really enjoys working with these smaller companies and ensuring that their nutrition facts table, their list of ingredients, the required label information is there in a proper compliant way. Yeah, absolutely. And it's such a big jump. Like when you think about, so we get a lot of people who come to us and they'll say, okay, well, I have this recipe that is fantastic. All my friends say, I'm the, I have the best pasta sauce. Yeah. I have the best cookie. I have whatever. Sure. And maybe some of them have gone to the next step and they've gone to a farmer's market. They've gone and maybe even gotten into one or two retail outlets. They don't realize what it takes to make it to that next step and to be able to distribute, to make it into a living. Because a lot of people start off, it's a side hustle, yeah. right? They're still working their day, their day job. Maybe they've rented out some space. And I love that passion. I love working with people who have, who bring that kind of passion and enthusiasm. But we also try to be really honest with them and say, this is a hard path. Like you have to know what's involved. There's people out there, there's resources, there's people like you guys who work with them in, in, these, in, in these really close ways. But it is not easy. And I think people have to be honest with themselves about what it's going to take um, because then they can make those plans appropriately. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Great. That kind of leads me in. I mean, you talked about how um, Manitoba's food and beverage industry, largest manufacturing sector. Yes. But of course, that comes with a lot of challenges. So we talked a bit about how there's you know regulatory challenges within. There's challenges getting onto the retail shelf. Mm -hmm. Anything else that you can give us kind of a, a, a dive into some of the, the challenges that they're facing? Yeah, so I think one of the things, and this is one, this is an area that is a particular passion of mine personally, uh, professionally, um, is around sustainability. So I think, you know, we're going to see a lot of changes in this. So we talked a little bit about regulation, food safety, right? This is key. You know, 30 years ago, um, you know, we went through, I think, a pretty big transformation in the professionalization of food safety, right? And in the ways in which a lot of the standards got set. Now, when you go to the grocery, you know, I think we're really lucky in Canada. We can go in and basically, you know, that 99% of the food on the shelves is going to be safe. Mm -hmm. And that's just sort of a baseline assumption. It's not something that you go in there and say, well, I have to find the safest food, right? I think we're going through a similar transformation with sustainability as becoming something that's table stakes. Um, I think governments around, you know, we went, last year was the hottest year on record. Um, the, fi the fires last year in Canada were unbelievable. They're already announcing a drought in Alberta. Um, if you look at how much snow we have here in Winnipeg, I wouldn't be surprised if we are also getting into a drought situation. 
that's a unique set of challenges for the agri-food sector, right? Um, we're really good and efficient at creating lots of food, but not under these kinds of conditions. And so I think that transition to a kind of a more, a lower carbon, a decarbonized food system, whether that's involving plant-based ingredients, whether it's involving whatever, so all sorts of paths towards that. It is a huge challenge. And I think it's going to be very, very difficult for a lot of the smaller players in particular. You're seeing leadership from a lot of the bigger companies. So we have a really big conference that's coming up soon on February 6th called, uh, um, called Cultivate Net Zero. And it is bringing together a lot of the people, a lot of uh, folks within this sector who are really looking ahead and saying, we need to get our heads around this, whether it's reporting and that kind of transparency piece, so the traceability, understanding where the, what, you know, where the food is coming from, what the greenhouse gas profile of it is, what the water footprint of it is, all of these different kind of components uh, to the kind of, what kind of claims can we make? with the consumers. They want to know. They want to know uh, what, what these pieces are. We're seeing a lot of changes in diets around people who are, in, you know, who want to be more flexitarian, who are reducing their alcohol intake, who are way more conscious about, about that food and where it comes from, how it was produced. And that's not going to be easy because it's not something one company can tackle by themselves. Mm -hmm. It's something that has to be done together. And so we see that as part of our role as an association is to sort of bring together those expertise bring together those networks, test out things, do pilot projects that can sort of look at how are we going to support the sector, especially those uh, small and medium-sized employees. And I know we're seeing with a number of our larger clients, yes. they're now putting out annual sustainability reports, yes. which I think five years ago, you know, wouldn't That's have right. existed. That's right. And again, it, it puts pressure on everybody else mm -hmm. uh, to be a me too. Mm -hmm. um, whether you're, and it, as you said, it will be a, sm a challenge for some of the smaller yes. companies. Conversely, smaller companies can sometimes pivot easier. Yes. And so that may be in the long run an advantage for the smaller companies who are bringing, because they come from more rural areas mm -hmm. and they understand the challenges of, from, you know, the old country, as we say, yes. getting the food to the table that they'll be able to create products that are more sustainable, built with more sustainable ingredients and packaged more sustainably. Yes, and I and I think I think you're right. I think there's sort of they, there's definitely opportunities for some of those smaller companies, but it's also that that ability to act. So we've tried to bring in a balance of that in this conference. So one of the lead uh, one of the lead you know one of the keynotes at the conference is Maple Leaf Foods, right? Five years ago, they became the largest company in the world, I believe, uh, that went carbon neutral, um, largest food com uh, company. Um, they've now since and a lot of that was achieved through uh, carbon offsets. So they went in, they did a lot of carbon offsets. They got a lot of critique for that, right? Um, and they, I, to their credit, they've looked at that and said, you know what? That we wanted to make that move. We want to report out on things. We want to look at our supply chain. And they now have an opportunity and are leading the way in terms of, uh, of, uh, of things like commitment to regenerative agriculture. They're looking at biodigesters. They're looking at all of these key technologies that are going to bring that into their operations. And they're lucky because they have the scale and the vertical integration to be able to do that. A lot of the smaller processors can't do that. But they can, like you said, also pivot a little bit more quickly. They can sort of say, hey, I actually know where my supply chain comes from because it comes from down the road. Yeah, I get my grain from, you know, Joe down the road. And so there's, there's, there's sort of opportunities on both sides. And one of, the, one of our goals at this conference is to say, look, we know this is going to be hard, but this is also a huge opportunity. I mean, we're here in Manitoba. We're, we're lucky. We have a lot of primary ingredients are produced right here. Um, we're in the center of the country, so we can transport out pretty easily. And we have a green electricity grid. Like those three things combined can position us to be real leaders in this space of sort of decarbonized food. But it means we have to embrace that and we have to look at that as an opportunity and not just as, oh, it's just another regulatory challenge. Well, and I also think that you have to depoliticize. That's too right. many, oh, yes. Too many subjects nowadays have become yes. political talking points rather than real talking points. And I think sustainability, yes. you know, is one of those where yes. sustainability is a pathway to success, not a cost of doing business. That's right. And, and it has to, and you have to look at all the different components of it, right? It's a three-legged stool. That's why we talk about our, our own strap plan is that people, people profit planet. Like it's a three-legged stool. You can't, if your business fails because you aren't profitable, that's not sustainable either, right? So how do we look at it? And one of the things that we do for, for our members as well, because also this is very difficult for companies of different sizes, is we do a lot of advocacy. 
So we talk with government regularly. We look at the regulations. We advocate on behalf of the industry. We develop programs to be able to support them through, say, grant writing, things like that. Like all of this is part of, um, you know, what I think why being part of an association really matters because we can be more of a collective voice for a sector, right? It's very rare that government wants to talk to one company unless you're the company. The company. Uh, so how, one of the best ways, especially if you're smaller, and 70% of our members, less than 10 employees. Oh, wow. Less than, and, and that is, that's the stat across the country in terms of, the, of that. That actually surprised me. When I joined, when I started this, um, this job, I was looking at the sort of stats of the country. And I was like, wow, I was really surprised how many small and medium-sized companies are actually micro companies there are. And I think that's partly because from your original origins and processors, everybody's ta- thinking of the maple leaves. That's right. The big f- ingredient right. suppliers, not the down the, the, the chain mm-hmm. implementers, manufacturers, servers, mm-hmm. small restaurants that all generate the fuel for yep. the big processors. Yep. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, I think you did a great job of summarizing a lot of the benefits of being a FAB member, mm-hmm. um, talking about you know support to the members. Mm-hmm. I know you do a lot of networking events yes. as well, um, being able to just yeah, provide the resources, give the updates that are required. Mm-hmm. Um, anything else that you want to mention that you know FAB does for its industry members? Yeah, so thing, I mean, I think it's sort of what I talked about kind of encapsulates most of it. The networking, I think, is actually um, something that our members frequently tell us is really important for them. Mm -hmm. Uh, It can be a lonely slog uh, in here. And sometimes just like connecting with other members and saying, hey, I'm working on this project can stimulate a collaboration that might be really impactful. Um, you know, all of these things are, 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 are super, super important, I think, when it comes down to it. I mean, we have ambitions we're really looking at. I think one of the things that our province is sadly missing right now is, is, uh, is, is production capacity that's shared. Um, you know, I think this is one area that we've been looking at for a while, but like a, a kind of an incubation, um, an accelerator, something where people can come in and rent a HACCP certified production facility mm-hmm. per hour. Um, every other province has one basically. Um, and we're, we're one of the few that don't. And unfortunately, a lot of people leave the province as a result of that. They go to Alberta, they go to Saskatchewan, they go elsewhere, they go to a co-packer somewhere else. And I think we lose out a lot because we don't have an affordable pathway to scaling it. Starting your own facility is terrifying. It is, it is expensive. It's the, you know, the compliance piece is massive. Um, it never works the way you think it's going to. <laughs> and so how do we de-risk that path forward? And you're not a, manuf- you're not a manufacturer. You, you've got an idea That's and right. you want to focus on the idea. So if you can offload, and it's the same with regulatory, you're not going to have your own regulatory no. experts. No. And they, if you do have someone who's helping with that, they can't keep current. So the That's advantage right. of having partners in the appropriate places who can offer the support to ensure your success are critical for the sector to grow and be thrive and be even more successful. Absolutely. And, and that's why we always at FAB think of ourselves as kind of par- partnership forward. If we, if there is something that someone else is doing out there, there's no need for us to duplicate it. Like we are happy to share the spotlight with everybody around here. I gave the example of the code initiative. This was one where we knew that equity, diversity, and inclusion training is important. Someone else is doing it. So our concern is, can our members access that? And so being able to negotiate with uh, the Manitoba chamber and say, look, like, we're not going to recreate this. Why, what would it take for our members to be able to access it at the rates that you guys have? Mm-hmm. And being able to do that, I think, is just so much more impactful because then you're not just wasting your energy and time. And so that's why we're always happy, too, when people call us up and say, hey, we want to, we need a labeling. We refer them out to you guys. Mm-hmm. We refer them out to people who do it. We're mm-hmm. not going to try to say, well, here, you know, do because you're right. Mm-hmm. How are you going to stay current on that? If you have three employees, four employees, all of which are wearing... Every hat. Yeah. And yeah, talking about, you know, supporting members by helping with updating regulations mm-hmm. or the, just really the ever-changing environment that is, you know, Health Canada's regulatory yes. processes. How would you suggest that a food and beverage company does work towards understanding these types of regulations that apply to them? Oh, yeah. It's, I mean, it, it's it's challenging, right? Because it, it, it changes depending on where you're, you know, where you're shipping things. Are you leaving the province? Like there's so much complexity to it. And I think 
you know, where you can obviously educate yourself. Um, we do offer certain kinds of trainings around that, whether it's sort of things that are focused in on HACCP, whether it's things we were just actually talking about um, within our team, some of the changes on front of label packaging. Uh, it's actually something that I want to chat with you guys about because I know it's coming. <laughs> yes. Like it's, it's, it's coming. Yeah. And there's still a little bit of uncertainty about when and how and who it's going to apply to, right, in the timelines, right? So, you know, this was something that I had now that, that was sort of uh, um, – that is on our radar and we're going to, we're going to go forward and we're going to chat with you and we're going to chat with others and say, okay, how do we prepare for something like that? And for us, it usually starts with some sort of webinar that we'll offer out to our, our, our uh, members that gives them at least that high level. Yep. And then we usually will refer out. So we do a lot of that kind of pathway navigation. So we'll say, Hey, you know what, uh, you know, S and I can help you with that. They're going to be able to help you with this, these components. And here are some things that we can sort of help you. So you, at least you understand and feel kind of a little bit more empowered around some of these. And a lot of our training is often like that, where we're sort of say, you know, we just did one, uh, we just did a webinar on ESG requirements. Um, and in, in the lead up, so we're doing a pilot project with a company called Theory Mesh, and they're trying to understand the kind of greenhouse gas emissions uh, across the, like from farm, right from the farm. And that's what's I think really tricky right now is if say you're, you're making crackers and you've got a wheat product in there. Well, what is, you might be able to find some high level data about how much greenhouse gas emissions were released by wheat in general, but you don't know how much it was in that specific instance. So they're trying to simplify that process. And so we offered this sort of um, webinar where they were able to come in, find out here are the regulatory changes that are coming, but, and here are the things that you start need to start doing. So we're working on a toolkit with them. Uh, they're going to provide that toolkit. It'll give you a bit of a map give you a map to sort of say, these are the kinds of questions you need to start asking of your supply chain. These are the kinds of questions that other suppliers might start asking of you. So how do you prepare for them? And I think that sort of gets you, it starts to prepare you so that you're at least ready to tackle it. And then, I mean, in most cases, what we're going to say is, you know, you really need to sit down with Theory Mesh or you need to sit down with SNI. You need to sit down with the experts in this once you get to that point. But I think that taking that first step where you empower people with at least enough knowledge that they understand is so crucial. Absolutely. And I think one of the, again, working with our team, one of the things our team is very good at is when we're talking to clients and giving them information, we're allowing them to make informed decisions. Yep. We're not just saying the regulation says A, yep. B, C. We're also saying here are your options, here are the risks, mm -hmm. here are the rewards, and you're making an informed decision. Right. So we're, we're walking beside them. We're That's not right. leading them. And I think a lot of our clients find that very helpful. For example, for Unapack, we have some companies coming to us now who are going to give us inventories of their products and say, which one? We don't know. Yeah. And these are yeah. large food companies and food um, brands. Which one of these will require front of pack? Mm -hmm. We'll give you our list. You'll go through it. And then we'll give you the labels. Mm -hmm. And we'll work with you to update the labels to meet the front of pack requirements. Yeah. And I think it's one, I, I think honestly, one of the best pieces of advice that you can give to a, a company like this is don't try to tackle everything yourself. No. There's so, because money is often so tight, I think people get really sort of hung up on this idea that I got to do it all. I got to be the expert in everything. And that will get you so far. But at some point, you have to realize that your time is valuable and there's an opportunity cost, right? Like you just, it, it, you're spending X amount of time on this. It takes you away from this. So know when that partnering and when finding that expertise is actually going to allow you to focus in on your core competencies, on those things that, you're, that you can actually bring value to. And I've seen too many people where they're just running themselves ragged because they're trying to do it all. And they're missing the, the important things because yeah. they get so hung up in the weeds. I think one of the best commercials used to say, pay me now or pay me later. That's right. And, That's right. and again, I yeah. sometimes have that conversation with clients. Feel free to do it. Yep. But I've seen this. We've gone down this road many times with clients. You'll be back. And to un yep. un unbreak, unfix the break yep. is much more costly than not breaking it in the first place. That's right. Um, that happens often. We talk a lot about distributors and the values of distributors. A lot of mm. people try to do, every, like they get into their first couple of retail uh, outlets and they want, it, they want to do the de deliveries themselves. They okay. want to collect the invoices. And we're like, okay, but for how long? Like, when, like at some point, you're driving like a like just 
a couple boxes to one site. You have to go there. You have to make sure it's shelved. You have to do all that. Like, yes, it's going to cost you 20%. On, but if you're not building that into your business model from the beginning, you will never scale. Like, you're always going to remain at that smaller size, which for some people is fine. That's okay. But like you said, it's it's that informed choice, like knowing and trying to plan for it earlier on. Um, and I think that's, again, one of the values of the networking, of connecting with your peers, of connecting with an association is that you could get a bit of that advice and and, it, and it, what, you can avoid a big headache later. And also understanding ultimately, yes, you may be in the local IGA or mm-hmm. co-op, but if you want to get out of the local right. one into their chain, your packaging can't just be um, market ready. It's got to be national ready. That's right. And you'll get the offer to go well, two or three more stores want you, but we can't take you because your label isn't fully compliant. That's right. So if you do it up front, you have a product, you know what your costs are, you're ready to, to, to be what you want to be is a national brand. Yeah, and, and I think that so so and you hear so there's a lot of a lot of the retailers have these great buy local programs, right? They do mm-hmm. try to sort of support some of that. But that like I think it's really important for people to see that as a as a first step, right? And so we have a training coming up. Um, we've got Peter Chapman coming in in April. He's going to be talking about how to actually leverage those buy local programs for that next step. So how do you go to be a national distributor at that point? How do you go? And and it, it, I think it's crucial. And it's also important to realize that there are really important timelines for that too. Like you need to be, if you're going to be approaching that, like you have to be thinking back six, eight, 10 months, have everything in order, be ready for when the the new product cycles come out and have that kind of, you know, plan those things out. Because if all of a sudden your product gets really popular and people start taking it and you cannot spin up, you've missed your window. Like you've, 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 you know, and, and, that could have been your chance to to launch off and become something big, and you just weren't ready to sort of. See and that chances of getting back in is pretty pretty slim once you've blown your opportunity. Yeah, I mean, what is it? I can't remember. Like the average grocery store might have twenty thousand items, um, and how many of them fail each year? Um, that, that the majority. Over, the majority. Yeah. You know, it's anywhere. I've heard statistics from seventy to ninety percent of new items fail uh, yeah. in any year. So it's not, not easy. Yeah, you, you, they haven't picked the easiest market nope. to get into. No. Nope. Wow. Yeah, that, that's, it's really insightful. It's really great that there are resources out there. Mm-hmm. We talk about, um, you know, no, you don't know what you don't know. That's really. right. That's that's, right. We say that all the time because, yes, you can Google um, front of pack labeling. If that's, that's right. the only thing that's on your mind, sure, you can probably do a pretty good job of that one area. But guess what? There's, you know, net weight type height requirements <laughs> and, you know, nutrition facts table, the nutrient yeah. analysis. There's yeah. so much that it, it does just make sense to, to utilize businesses that are already there, they're already experts. Mm-hmm. So Team S and I recently released a blog about some of the food trends that we think are going to be big mm-hmm. in 2024. Um, we talked about things like plant-based options, definitely mm-hmm. sustainable foods, and then functional foods as well. Mm-hmm. Those food ingredients that have maybe a, a health benefit, uh, mood balance, or stress management. What do you think some of the trends will be for 2024? Yeah, I mean, I think you guys are bang on. I mean, those are uh, those are the ones that we definitely see growing. Um, we've seen a massive growth in uh, the 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 non-alcoholic and functional beverage category. Um, you know, you're seeing way beyond the kind of typical dry January uh, type things. You're seeing a lot of these kind of um, almost like, you know, things like kombucha, but like elixirs and mm-hmm. the kind of you know including adaptogens, things like that. And people are way more conscious about um, the health impacts of of sleep of brain health, aging population means that people are thinking about things like how do we prevent dementia? How do we prevent this? So I think they're interested in what their food can provide for them and how it can increase their performance in a lot of different areas. So I think we'll see a lot more growth in that. Um, When it comes to plant-based, you know, I think a lot of these companies, we've seen a big transition, right? The Beyond Meats, which were basically tech companies, um, have created something that was for it was an interesting approach right they created something that was for non-vegetarians right and they tried to create something that was very kind of like like a meat analog Mm -hmm. and and i think that was interesting and they they, there's still a lot of growth there and i think that a lot of people have been trying to like say oh that's this just a trend it's going to disappear i don't think it will like i think we're going to see a lot more but i think it's going to be plant forward like whole ingredient forward i mean we're seeing a lot of people 
want clean labels in general for whatever mm-hmm. reason they just want to see things that they can pronounce uh, on those True. things yeah. um, and so I think you know uh, nature's created a lot of really great plant proteins for us they're called <laughs> beans <laughs> and so I think we're going to see a lot of plant forward kind of formulations that with with ingredients that you can kind of pronounce uh, and uh, and 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 I think people are going to sort of it's going to be also like the kind of non-alcoholic uh, seg- segment it's not going to be like abstinence it's going to be like a flexitarian or a reduction you know reductionary and like it's going to be i think people want options yeah. mm-hmm. uh, into there and they want them to be tasty like they don't want them just to be like a, oh i'm doing this to self-flagellate myself because it's better for the environment or my heart yeah. like they want it to be tasty and but also so i think and we talked about that earlier people have way higher expectations of their food mm-hmm. uh, than they used to right Yeah. Yeah. I think it doesn't help that, you know, there's been some negative associations with certain things too, including alcohol, but Mm -hmm. food dyes, stuff like that. Like there's just been research into it that now it's coming out and people are seeing more and they don't want that necessarily for their children. They don't want that potential. That's right. So it's just, it's all about options. I look at the baby foods now that are available uh, (laughs) compared to when, you know, our kids are in their forties and I look at what baby food looked like back then and it was just globs of gelatinous stuff and you look at and you look at some of it now and in the pouches you go i'd eat that yeah, yeah. And, and and it's it's wonderful and you yeah. re- look at the ingredients and it's oh it is pears and bananas yeah and it's only pears and bananas yeah. and i can i know what i'm eating and the yeah. same is now evolving you know with grown-ups i don't necessarily want to be a vegetarian mm-hmm. but i'm happy to eat something that gives me that protein fill that has a mouthfeel that doesn't, it's not like I'm eating a salad. Yeah. And I think the, the plant-based analogs have evolved. Mm-hmm. And, you know, at the trade shows we do, you, you try some plant-based, you know, pea, especially the pea protein mm-hmm. ones, and you're going, these are really, like, mm-hmm. I, I could eat this as a meal mm-hmm. and skip the meat. And mm-hmm. it's really cool how the innovators are innovating healthy, mm-hmm. not, you know, lab, like you said, lab experiments. Yeah, and I think there still will be a place for that. Like, I mean, last last year when we had our conference, we brought in someone from Liven who was talking about cellular agriculture, right? So I think there's, there, I mean, this will be, an in, mm-hmm. uh, I'm paying attention to this space as well because I think it's really interesting. Um, you know, I think it is, you know, seeing where that innovation will push us and how it will go in tension with some of these more natural sort of desires for people. But I think with some of these, with cellular agriculture, right? If like, if you can just grow it, and it's a chicken breast, and that's what you're growing, and it is identical to a chicken breast, you know, it'll be interesting to see what consumer acceptance of that will be, because they're getting ready in the States. I think they have ice cream that's uh, that's grown like that, in, in, in um, you know, that's that's basically, it's cellular agriculture, right? It's it's ice cream without cows, but it's it's dairy. It's, it's you know, so I think we'll see more and more of that, um, partly because, that kind of fermentation also, depending on how it gets branded as well, because that fermentation, I think people get afraid of it sometimes, but it's also like the, the pillar of our food system as well. Like how much, how many things do we ferment? And it's totally safe. Um, so I think there's going to be a lot of education that needs to be done in that space, but also there's going to be just a lot of pressures. Um, you know, when it comes to the sustainability pieces around there, I think as more jurisdictions require transparency in this it's going to be harder and harder to kind of comply um and so i think we're going to see a lot of innovation come out as and a result it may ultimately be more cost effective yes. than growing a cow Absolutely. maybe you know growing a cow in a lab as mm-hmm. opposed to growing a cow out in a field and mm-hmm. you know being at the mercy of mother nature and right. all the inputs that you require you've got everything in you know mm-hmm. and again i would be more than willing i actually kind of looking forward to when I can try lab grown chicken or mm-hmm. meat. Yeah. I, I think it'd be really cool. Yeah. Yeah. Apparently you can try it. I mean, you can already eat it in certain jurisdictions. It's not allowed in Canada yet. Yeah. Uh, I don't think the milk is either, but I think all you have to do is go across the border and you can have, um, yeah, there's a couple, I think it's, I can't remember the name of the company, but yeah, they do the lab grown um, milk. And, and so anyway, this live in came in and she was talking about, cause they're doing, they're talking about collagen. So they're trying to do, they're trying to grow collagen in there Mm -hmm. to be added to plant-based. So like if you have the, you were talking about mouthfeel, so important when it comes to a lot of these plant-based analogs. And if you can put in essentially animal collagen without the animal, 
you can get a much better mouthfeel for a lot of these plant-based products. So I think that's what they're trying to do is just, it's, it's one ingredient in, in that kind of deck. So innovation, really. It's, it's just yeah. going to take us who knows where, but it's all Yeah, well, I think that's, to me, it's what's exciting. In the next, I think, 20, 30 years, we're going to see as many changes in the food system as we did in the last 100. Um, and I think part of that is going to be, well, most of it is going to be driven by the fact that, we, you know, we, have, we still have a growing population. We, there's a huge increase in demand for protein. And we've really hit a limit in terms mm -hmm. of how much land is available for that. Um, you know, agriculture is responsible for a third of global uh, greenhouse gas emissions, 70% of all water use, and like 80%, um, you know, or 80% uh, of all land use. Um, it is massive. Like, there's nowhere else to go at this point. So we're going to have to innovate when it comes to that. And, and I think health also, health, as that's right. cost of health care right. becomes prohibitive for a lot of people, the yes. only way they're going to be able to try and get healthy yes. is through what they eat that's right. and can afford in a grocery store. So I may not be able to go in and afford a prescription because right. I've developed something, but if I can get chia or some mm -hmm. natural food that's that right. helps mitigate a health concern, high blood pressure, high sugar, that's, that's going to be an affordable alternative for people to the medical system is eating healthy foods that taste like not healthy foods. That's right. And I think there's a lot of government su sort of support and interest in this as well. Like I think we're starting to see governments say, well, we can't create a healthcare system that's totally reactive. Um, we do need to start thinking about prevention and diet, exercise, all of these kinds of things are so important. So I think you're right. I mean, I think we're going to see a lot more of these kind of health claims around that. It's going to become part of the way people think about that kind of longevity, especially as boomers are starting to age and they're, they want to age well in their homes. They have disposable income. Like if we're, I think we're going to see a lot of that sort of driving that. And then on that flip side, younger people who already have said, we're, we're interested in food and we want to have good quality food, um, you know, and they're willing to pay for it. So. And they've seen what us boomers have done to the world. So yeah. they, 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 they don't want to follow in our footsteps yeah. as, as a late yeah. tail end boomer. Yeah. yeah. So we talked a lot about sustainability and mm -hmm. protecting the environment. What unique steps is FabMB taking mm -hmm. towards a more sustainable future? Yeah, so it's a it's a huge priority for us. So like I said, we have the Cultivate Conference that's coming up that really brings together, I think, a lot of key stakeholders around that. A lot of, um, you know, the trade show alone will have folks that you'll be able to connect with. So that partnership-based approach, right? We're, mm -hmm. we're, we're kind of curating it so that it has people who are practicing in this space and are able to help you. So whether it's companies like Theory Mesh who are working on that kind of transparency or, or other companies who can help you create a more efficient uh, and energy, uh, use less energy within your plant. It's the whole spectrum, right? Um, from there, we also work a lot on little, on pilot projects around training. Uh, as I said before, we do a lot of workforce development. That's kind of where our core funding comes from. So one of the areas that we, we know is going to be a challenge is Who's going to do this work? This is a new skill set, right? Like going in and doing sort of a life cycle assessment of, a, of, a, of, a, of your supply chain, understanding those greenhouse gas emissions, doing all that. Right now, there's like a big skill shortage when it comes to that, right? So you're going to need to upskill your existing staff and you're going to need to have a pipeline. So, you know, we work a lot with the post-secondaries to sort of say, okay, what, what does that look like over the next couple of years? Um, but that, all, and then also what are the trainings that we can offer around that? So you see that, you know, on our, on our, on our website, we're constantly posting, uh, different, whether it's small webinars, whether it's pilot projects, whether it's, you know, sharing people's stories of success, right? Um, all, everything, everything, uh, um, around that just to sort of be able to, again, prepare people around that. So I think it's a, it's a huge priority. It's something that we will continue to focus on, um, because I think it's one of those areas that, a, could really help Manitoba differentiate itself, but also I think is one of the areas in which a lot of our members, um, I think, get overwhelmed by. Yeah, and just need that extra support. Yeah. Great. Well, we're really looking forward to the trade show, the conference that you have coming up, all the future resources that we can use and how your members can maybe utilize SNI's help mm -hmm. as well. Thank you so much to both you, Mike, and Stuart for joining today, and we'll see you next time. Thanks for listening to the SNI podcast. To learn more about SNI and receive even more resources to help you reach your business goals, including information on regulatory compliance, clinical trials, and creative solutions for the natural health and food industries, follow us at source-nutraceutical-inc on LinkedIn. 
You can also visit our website at sourcenutra.com. Thanks again and see you next time.